Arizona is a bit of a strange place. Not just because of its insane climate or the strange creatures that live there, but also because of the people who call it home. After all, it takes a special kind of person to come out to this patch of land in the middle of the desert where there's no water and absolutely nothing grows and think to themselves, yeah, this seems like a perfect place to live. Arizona is a weird place, and Arizonans are a weird people. It's something we embrace out here, so it only makes sense that the sports teams that represent us would follow that same pattern. Over the past 60 years, Arizona's professional sports teams have built a long, bizarre, and often cursed history. One filled with incredible moments, devastating heartbreak, iconic characters, constant threats of relocation, and one shining golden moment that stands above the rest. And yet, despite all the heartbreak, all of the collapses, and all of the terribly timed injuries that they have had to suffer through over the years, Arizona's die-hard sports fans keep coming back to support their teams day in and day out. We often get asked why we choose to live in a state with such an unforgiving climate. And similarly, we get asked why we choose to stand behind our often mediocre sports teams, even when they have a penchant for tearing our hearts out. And there's plenty of answers that we could give to those questions, but the most truthful answer is this. Arizona is our home, and for better or for worse, these teams, well, these teams are ours. This is the story of Arizona's professional sports teams and the people who love them. Welcome to the Valley. 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 Our journey into the history of Arizona professional sports begins way before any pro team stepped foot in the state, and in fact, well before Arizona even became a state in the first place. In January of 1885, Arizona's 13th Territorial Legislature would convene in the capital of Prescott, and over the course of their session that year, they'd become known for many things. They'd become known as the Thieving 13th, for the massive amount of money that they spent on themselves over the course of the session. They'd also be known for putting the territory in over a million dollars worth of debt. So much debt, in fact, that the US Congress had to pass a law the very next year limiting the amount of debt that territories could get into. Additionally, this legislature in particular was well known for its violence, with fights regularly breaking out in the halls and the nearby bars, and one extreme example involving a bullwhip and a monkey wrench. But by far its biggest legacy out of all of them were two decisions that were relatively minor throughout the course of the session. On their way up to Prescott that year, the delegation from Tucson and Pima County had a lot on their agenda that they wanted to accomplish. First and foremost, they wanted to move the capital of the territory back to Tucson, where it had been previously. Additionally, they were also competing for a $100,000 grant to host and build a new asylum in Arizona, as well as a bunch of other public works projects that were being assigned over the course of that year's session. But unfortunately for them, 1885 wouldn't turn out to be their year, like, at all. For starters, their proposal to move the capital back to Tucson was literally dead on arrival, as a group of representatives met and voted to block the measure before the delegation had even arrived to the territorial legislature. And shortly after that, they would strike out on literally every other item that they were hoping for over the course of the session, not only missing out on the $100,000 asylum, but also on smaller projects such as roads, bridges, the territorial jail, and railroads. 
Not wanting to leave the session empty-handed, the delegation reached out and hesitantly grabbed for the last thing still on the table. The thing that literally no other city or county wanted anything to do with. That being the charter to create Arizona's very first university. Because as we all know, having a university in your town basically means that you will never have a thriving local economy, let alone any kind of economic development. After all, who had ever heard of a professor buying a drink at the local bar, let alone a student? I know I haven't. Anyway, when the delegation returned to Tucson later that year practically empty-handed, the people of Tucson welcomed them back with open arms. And by that I mean, they threw spoiled vegetables at him, and allegedly, in one case, a dead cat. In fact, public opinion of the university was so low in Tucson that nobody wanted to provide the land to build the actual campus, and they were likely going to let the authorization expire and let the charter go to some other town. But at the very last hour, two gamblers and a saloon keeper would provide the city with 40 acres worth of land. And on that land, they would build a large schoolhouse, which would come to be known as Old Main. And the University of Arizona was born. Meanwhile, Maricopa County and the city of Phoenix made out extremely well during that same session. Not only did Phoenix receive the $100,000 to build the new asylum, but the nearby city of Tempe also received $25,000 for the building of a normal school, where the territory's teachers would be trained. Similar to the university down in Tucson, the normal school was established in 1885, but while this school was originally intended to serve a singular purpose, the size and scope of the school would greatly increase in the coming decades. For example, in 1925, it would officially be labeled as a teacher's college, rather than a normal school. In 1929, the name would change again, this time making it the Arizona State Teachers College. And by 1945, the curriculum had grown so broad that teachers was dropped from the name altogether. However, it wouldn't be until 1958 that the school would receive its new name as we know it today. Arizona State University. Two houses, both alike in dignity, in fair Arizona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. In hindsight, it only makes sense that these two had become bitter rivals. After all, the Metro Tucson and Phoenix areas have always had beef with each other. At first, it was about things like which of the two cities deserved to be the rightful capital. But in recent years, it's looked much more like a proxy war between the two universities. And nowhere was this more apparent than on the field of play. Over the years, both schools would develop their own personalities and specialties in the classroom and in athletics. For example, the University of Arizona became well known for its programs in the hard sciences, agriculture, and medicine, while also developing one of the best programs for basketball and softball in the country. Meanwhile, Arizona State was able to stick to its roots with its teacher's college, while also developing great programs in journalism and business, and also putting together one of the country's best baseball programs year after year. But while both sides had their specific specialties, there was one area of the athletic arena where neither side had a distinct advantage, and that was the gridiron. In fact, the most enduring image of this rivalry is likely the Territorial Cup, which is the trophy that is given out to the winner of the U of A ASU football game every single season. At 122 years old, the Cup is the oldest rivalry trophy in all of college football and it really paints a picture as to how deep this rivalry goes. It was first handed out in 1899, when it was part of a four-team tournament between the four biggest schools in the Arizona Territory, U of A, the Normal School, Phoenix Union High School, and Phoenix Indian School. But when the Normal School was officially recognized as a four-year college in 1925, it evolved into a regular matchup between them and U of A. And by 1946, it evolved into an annual Thanksgiving tradition. Over the years, both teams have taken turns controlling their side of the rivalry, with ASU dominating some decades and U of A dominating others. But overall, it's been historically a very even matchup, 
with an overall record of 49 wins for U of A, 44 wins for ASU, and one tie in 1987. As you might imagine, their 99 meetings thus far have produced plenty of instant classics and some major upsets over the years. But more than anything, this is a game about making a statement, and it's about way more than just football. Take 1958 for example. At the time, Arizona State was petitioning to become a full-fledged university, and the measure was about to be put to a statewide vote. As you might imagine, U of A, its alumni, and its fans were all very much opposed to this measure, as its university status was one of the few things that it still had left to hold over ASU's head. But if ASU was phased at all by their opposition, they really didn't show it. Not only did they roll into Tucson that year and beat the Wildcats, but they absolutely embarrassed them on their home turf, beating them with the final score of 47 to nothing. Needless to say, later that year, Arizona State College would officially become Arizona State University. Now, earlier on, I mentioned that this was going to be a series focused on Arizona's professional sports teams. So you might be wondering why I'm spending all this time talking about two college teams. And well, there are three reasons for this. First, given the sheer amount of money that these teams bring in every single year, as well as college teams all around the country, it's hard not to classify them as professional teams that are operating primarily with unpaid interns. Second, understanding the U of A and ASU rivalry is integral to understanding the history of Arizona sports in general, as even today, the Territorial Cup is one of, if not the biggest event in Arizona sports every single year. And that is largely due to reason number three, which is the fact that ASU and U of A provided the blueprint not just for Arizona sports, but for Arizona sports fandom. For fans on both sides of the rivalry, who they root for is not just a mascot or a team, it's something that's fully a part of them. And for a lot of people, something that's been passed down from generation to generation. When you drive around the cities of Tucson and Tempe, one thing that really stands out at you is just how much pride they have in their respective teams. And that's something that also really stands out at you when you talk to a fan of either of these two programs. In other words, if there's one thing that ASU and U of A's athletic programs have taught us over the years, it's that if they have something to root for, Arizonans can be some of the most passionate and loyal fans in the entire country, and they will fight for their team to the ends of the earth. And if it weren't for that level of passion, loyalty, and support, there would be no way that professional sports would ever take root in the Valley of the Sun. But with that being said, it was only a matter of time before major sports leagues started trying to knock on Arizona's door. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, the four major North American sports leagues had clustered themselves in the Northeast and Midwest United States, partly because the climate down south made things difficult for outdoor sports like football and baseball, but also because at the time, traveling across the country was still very difficult and also quite exhausting for the athletes involved. But shortly after the end of World War II, with advances in air travel, expansions to the interstate highway system, major metropolitan areas popping up along the Pacific, moving out west was made easier than ever, and as such, leagues raced to expand their outreach toward the Pacific. At first, this took the form of existing teams packing up their bags and moving out west. The Minneapolis Lakers moved out to Los Angeles, where there are no lakes. Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers moved out to Los Angeles where there are no trolleys to dodge, and the Cleveland Rams moved out to Los Angeles where, well, there actually are Rams. But at a certain point, you eventually run out of teams that are willing and able to move across the country and alienate their fan base. And so, the leagues decided to set their sights more towards expansion, and this was especially the case in the NBA at the time. During the 1950s and the 1960s, basketball received a huge increase in popularity in the United States, and as the game grew in popularity, so too did the NBA. In order to take advantage of this new popularity, the NBA decided to kill two birds with one stone, expanding their outreach toward the western United States while also expanding the number of teams and the amount of available revenue in the league. 
Heading into the later part of the 1960s, there were only two teams that were representing the West Coast, the aforementioned Lakers and the San Francisco Warriors. But heading into the 1967 season, two more expansion teams would join the mix out West, the Seattle Supersonics and the Pacific Northwest, and the San Diego Rockets in the Southern California Bay. But even with these two new teams being added to the mix, the NBA was far from done with its plans for expansion. And in fact, they planned on adding two more teams for the 1968 season, with Phoenix being one of the main cities considered for a new franchise. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Hello darkness, my old friend. The year was 1967, and real estate investor Richard L. Block was on a mission to bring Phoenix its first ever major sports franchise. However, it wasn't going to be an easy task. At the time, most people still saw Phoenix, and Arizona in general, as being a bit of a Wild West town, a market that wasn't big enough or developed enough to support its own major franchise. And in fact, when Block was able to get a meeting with the NBA commissioner at the time, he even said as much, essentially calling him crazy and that Phoenix was never going to be able to support its own NBA franchise. However, Block saw Phoenix for what it really was, which was one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the country, with a populace that had a particular interest in basketball. And so, at Block's urging, he sent the commissioner down to Phoenix to talk with the local residents and get a feel for the city. And after that trip, he seemed to be incredibly impressed. And fortunately for Block, it seemed like that trip was all the commissioner needed to convince him that Phoenix was actually ready. And so, just like that, it seemed like Phoenix's big league dreams were one step closer to becoming reality. However, having a city that was ready for a big league team was one thing but actually creating that team was a whole different beast. When it comes to creating your own expansion franchise from scratch, there are a few steps that you need to take. The first and most important of which is to gather a group of investors together that are willing and able to spend the money necessary to buy the team in the first place. After all, even though this was 1967, expansion fees for the major sports leagues were still incredibly expensive in this case around $2 million. So Block and his team got to work bringing an investment group together that would raise the necessary capital. Initially, this ownership team was made up of two distinct groups. The majority ownership was made up of what I like to call the business guys, and these are the typical institutional investors that you would find in a project like this. They worked in big money industries such as finance and real estate, and they included big names like local businessman Carl Eller. On the other side, you had the minority ownership group, which was mostly made up of what I like to call the entertainment guys. These were people that were very famous and successful in the entertainment industry, and they were hoping to A, support their local team, and B, build up their portfolio in entertainment and business. And these included people such as Bobby Gentry, Andy Williams, and Ed Ames. Through this investment group, they were able to successfully raise enough funds to pay for the NBA's expansion fees. And with the city vetted, the investment group in place, and Block overseeing the initial proposal for the team, the NBA officially awarded Phoenix with its own franchise in the beginning of 1968. And they would enter the league alongside a new team from Milwaukee, whom we probably won't be bringing up at all for the rest of this series. But now that the team was finally a reality, it was now time to give them an actual identity, and the first order of business was coming up with a name. In order to do this, the team decided to do something that would never fly in the age of the internet. They held a public naming contest. Fans from around the state would submit their potential team names to the Arizona Republic newspaper and every single fan who submitted a proposal would get a free ticket to a future game, with the one grand prize winner getting $1,000 cash and season tickets for the first season. All in all, over 28,000 people submitted their proposals to the newspaper. And as you might imagine, the names that they came up with were all over the place. 
with names ranging from the Rattlers to the Tumbleweeds to my personal favorite, the Dudes. But eventually, it became clear that there was a far and away favorite among the pack, and as a result, the team officially became known as the Phoenix Suns, with Phoenix resident Celinda King winning the grand prize for her submission. The original logo was designed by a Tucson resident by the name of Stan Fay, who at the time was running a commercial printing plant. The design itself was simple enough. It featured a glowing orange sun streaking through the sky with piping to make it look like a basketball. But over time, the iconic design would become so synonymous with the Phoenix team that not only would it stick with the team for its first 24 years of existence, but an altered version of it is still in use to this very day. And for his massive contribution to the Suns franchise, Fabe was awarded a whopping sum of 200 US dollars. With the team name and logo now officially in place, it was now time to figure out where the team was going to actually play their games. And luckily for the Suns, the perfect place had just opened up for them. In 1965, the Arizona Veterans Memorial Coliseum opened its doors for the very first time next to the Arizona State Fairgrounds. Originally, the venue was designed to hold many different types of events, including concerts, conventions, and stuff related to the fair. However, with its 14,000 seat capacity, theater style seating, and arena-like environment, the team realized that this would provide a perfect atmosphere for basketball. And so, rather than asking for an arena of their own to play their games in, they would instead strike a deal to make the Coliseum their official home starting in 1968 an agreement that would eventually stay in place for the next 24 seasons. Slowly but surely, the team was starting to take shape, and piece by piece, things were starting to come together. However, the next item on the to-do list was going to be the trickiest of them all, and that was figuring out who was going to build and run the team on a day-to-day -day basis. As the de facto leader of the ownership group and the guy responsible for getting everything together in the first place, Block took the reins as the initial president of the organization, but as far as who he wanted as his GM, he had a specific vision for who he wanted running things. As the newest team in the league, he wanted somebody who had a similarly fresh perspective on the game. Someone who not only knew the game like the back of their hand and could lead the team into the future, but also represented the future of basketball in general. And in his eyes, there was only one person that was up for the task. At the time, he was serving as one of the head scouts for the newly formed Chicago Bulls, and he was quickly developing a name for himself in the industry. Like many people at the time, he was also skeptical about the concept of Phoenix becoming an NBA city. But as the years went by, not only would he become a believer, he would also become something of a patron saint of Arizona sports, and arguably the single most influential person in this story. In fact, if you know anything about Arizona sports heading into this video, there's probably a good chance that you already know exactly who I'm talking about. It was February of uh, 68. By the end of that day, you know, I was being offered the job to come to Phoenix. And I, I do remember this very, very vividly, and that's uh, being a little bit pressured to make a decision to, to say yes. And I told the, the people interviewing me, I said, look, I can't, I can't do that. I need to go home, speak to my wife. I have these other options. I'll get back to you in a few days. And then I excused myself and I got to a phone. And I called my wife and my quote to her was, pack your bags, babe, it's Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix. At just 28 years old, Jerry Colangelo was named the youngest general manager in NBA history. But even as he stepped into the role, he knew that his work was going to be cut out for him. Both he and the ownership group both knew that if the team didn't have some semblance of success within the first few seasons, that the venture was going to be in danger of failing before it even really got off the ground. After all, most of the basketball fans in the state already had a team that they considered their own. So not only did they need to give those fans a reason to switch their allegiances, but they also need to give non-basketball fans a reason to care about the game, and the Suns in particular. In other words, Colangelo needed to build a winner in Phoenix as soon as humanly possible. 
and in order to assist him with this endeavor, one of his first moves as general manager was to hire away Chicago's head coach, Red Kerr, who had just won Coach of the Year in 1967 after leading the Bulls to the playoffs in their first ever season. And considering their history of working together in Chicago, it was hoped that Colangelo and Kerr could work together and bring about some positive chemistry in Phoenix. But with the leadership and coaching staff now officially in place, it was now time for the most important part of the team building process, which was, well, actually building the team. And just like every expansion franchise, that process started with the official expansion draft where new teams would draft players from other teams' rosters in order to start their team. The 1968 expansion draft consisted of three distinct rounds, where the Bucks and the Suns would take turns selecting six players each. At the beginning of the night, every other team in the league would select seven of their players to be protected from the draft, and after each round of the draft, they would get to select an additional player to protect. And while this took out most of the top players in the league, it did leave a few great players that the Bucks and the Suns could use to build their rosters. By virtue of a coin flip, the Suns ended up with the very first pick in the draft that night. And with that pick, they would go on to select Dick Van Arsdale, a 6'5 guard from the New York Knicks. And due to the unique honor of becoming the very first player in team history, Arsdale would become known to Suns fans as the original Sun. And of course, we'll talk a lot more about how he lived up to that nickname later on in the series. But beyond Arsdale, there were plenty of other interesting names that the Suns chose in the expansion draft, including future Hall of Famer Gail Goodrich, Neil Johnson, Dave Latton, Stan McKenzie, McCoy McLemore, Dick Snyder, and George Wilson. By the end of the night, Richard Block, Jerry Colangelo, and the rest of the leadership team had finally crossed off the last item on the expansion franchise checklist, and the dream of bringing a major sports franchise to Phoenix had finally become a reality. On October 4th, 1968, the Suns would play their first ever home game, an exhibition against the San Diego Rockets. At the time, nobody quite knew what to expect from the new team. But over the next 10 seasons, the Suns and their fans would be put through an emotional roller coaster, as their first decade of existence would be defined by ups and downs, surprise performances, and one of the greatest NBA Finals games of all time.